Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to BC314, our class on media and technology. Uh, let's just have a quick word of prayer and we'll pray together and then get started. Could somebody please lead us in prayer? Precious Father, we thank you. Praise you, honor you, God, Master, for this day which you have given to us. Once again, we are coming together. Lord, Master, we ask you, Father, fill us with your wisdom and understanding to receive your word. And Father God, we can imply everything what we are learning in our, in our life for God. We ask you, Father, fill your servant with the wisdom and prepare each one of our heart to receive the word of Father God, which is going to be come out from his mouth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. So we're now, uh, or rather, last last week, um, last Friday, Friday, in in this course, we talked about uh, creative art. Right? That's what we talked about. And uh, okay, maybe I can just share the notes. Just quickly review, and uh, there's some little discussion I just want to do today, and then get into the next topic. All right. So we talked about creative arts, which is again a, is a is a wide range of things. Could include dance and drama and mime and painting, writing, poetry, spoken word, and so on. So there's just so many different expressions. What I did not add was um, uh, you know things like sculpture, uh, and then there are other artistic expressions um, which could you know, could be expressed even in the architecture of uh, the buildings. I'm not saying we are worshipping the building, but the, the building is an expression of uh, creativity, uh, which is directed towards God, to glorify God, and so on. So there are many, many ways in which creativity can be expressed. We've just listed some of the more common ones, right? So what I wanted to do, and at I think we tried to do this towards the end of the class last week. Is you know how do we encourage this um, creative arts? Uh, we know the impact. We know the powerful impact that creative arts, whatever expression, uh, poetry or spoken word, dance and drama and so on. We know the the impact it has, both in worship towards God, and also in as a means of communicating to people. Right. But uh, what I wanted to discuss was how do we encourage this in the uh, church? In and you think about it for, in the context of a local church. Uh, how do we encourage this? And how can we, as uh, as God's people, bring out expressions? in a way that will be impactful, especially if we are using it as a means of communication to the world or to people or to the world. How can we do this so good, so well, that it be impactful? Because uh, if you don't do it well, uh, people aren't going to pay attention to it. You know. So example, if you just do a little drama for the sake of doing a drama, People in the church may put up with it, but definitely people on the outside, if you're trying to reach people outside, they are not going to be, you know, they're not going to come. But we need to do something that is very good, that's excellent, that's impactful. It has to be meaningful, of course. We're communicating God's word or the message of the gospel through that. My, uh, my question is, how can this be nurtured in the church, and I'm speaking, you know, first we can speak in the context of a local church, and then we can also speak in a wider sense of the body of Christ, right? So I just want to discuss that a little bit uh, before we move forward. So I want to get your thoughts on, we understand, you know, the creative arts. We understand how powerful it is both in worship and in ministry towards people. The question is, how do we encourage that in the local church? What can we do to encourage that? Um, just 
anyone can share your thoughts. Anyone? No thoughts, no ideas? Okay. All right, so um, uh, how is it being done in your context, in your local church? How are creative arts, how is creative arts, or is it being, is it being, do you see it's being encouraged? Do you see it happening? Or is it like something that's completely neglected? So maybe we should start with that question. Uh, is it a happening or is it not happening in your local church context? Say. Uh, thank you, Pastor. So for creative arts, you know, in the context of my church, um, so well, maybe I'll just start with my journey in different churches and then come back to my church. So for creative arts, mainly when I was back home, uh, it was more of dramas, um, playlets, basically on you know different aspects of our christian journey it could be on faith it could be on um, spiritual powers how we are able to conquer spiritual powers um you know evil powers with the word um knowing our identity and all sorts and then our uh, true school mainly we had people in my um generation featuring more in dance so we had people dancing, basically mimes and mm -hmm. uh, choreography, basically um, to just demonstrate a song, you know, using body movements and all that. Um, then spoken word is very, very, very powerful to many people uh, in our, uh, my church, the church I was initially before this one. Uh, we had a lot of people who were into spoken word. Who would just come to give a powerful, powerful uh, piece of God's word in ver uh, using different uh, words, you know, just to communicate. Um, could be on love, it could be on anything about the scriptures, it could be on God Himself, you know. Um, and um, we usually do this maybe for special events, as an outreach event, yeah, where we use creative arts that's appealing and things that. Um, Young people can easily catch. It, young people can easily understand. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you get them more using drama, spoken words, you know, dance, compared to someone preaching. Or you just complement whatever the preacher is going to be preaching on the pulpit with the dramas, with the spoken word, with the uh, mimes or the dances, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's 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 um it's something I believe we cannot um, just neglect uh, particularly in a generation that has gone digital in a generation that um, likes things being demonstrated um, and uh, would and likes to visualize things you know um so i i think it's a it's a very very useful tool um in creative arts it's something that um, should be encouraged and yeah, that's how basically we're using it here over in our church. Yeah. Good, good. So thank you for sharing. That's very good. Now, uh, so how, how did the, you know, it, it, just from your observations, how was this nurtured in the local, ch local church? I mean, what, what, how do they do it? How do they make it happen uh, in the local church? How do they encourage creative arts practically? So, uh, Practically, um, so uh, I'll speak for the one I'm currently at now. Um, first of all, you have to identify who who is interested. Um, it's one thing for the pastor to desire to have a department. It's another thing for someone to be willing to spearhead the department. So there has to be someone who is really, really passionate about it, you know, and. Um, is willing to draw more people. So I found out that once he was able to find someone, everybody just gravitated. Everyone who 
school he didn't even know, you know, had the gift of maybe acting, you know, dancing, you know, everybody just started coming when a department was created in the church mm, mm. and a head was placed over, you know, over that department, someone who is passionate about it and gifted, you know. And uh, so from there, that was how it started. And even then, it's sprinkled down into the teenagers. We started seeing teenagers also, you know, getting involved in acting dramas, you know. We started seeing people dancing, you know, and all that. So I think, first of all, it's just a pastor getting someone who can spearhead that department and creating a department that everybody can belong to mm. and then ensuring that you give them um, the, uh, the you give them the space to be as creative as possible. You know, just give them that give them that space, encourage them, and allow them to allow them to think beyond. You know, to go over and beyond because you know once you're able to give them that um, atmosphere, that encouragement, that push. Uh, not not necessarily push, but basically just that um, uh, um, space to be able to think and bring up ideas, creative ideas, you know, to dramatize or to um, show the scriptures in another light that everybody understands and every, everyone's able to connect to. Uh, it helps the creative art department to try and mm. to do more. Yeah. Mm. 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 Very good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for sharing. So I can, you know, from what you said, what you shared, I can see that you know there are these three main things. One is the pastor needs to have a vision to for that. You know, they need to see the value in uh, the the benefit that the creative arts ministry can have for the church community. Right? Uh, there are so many benefits, and and it, it's it's first of all, you know, like the the pastor must have a vision for it. Uh, that you know, hey, that through creative arts, uh, you know, you can communicate powerfully, you can worship God and glorify God, and also kind of brings people together. You know, it's a it's a great thing when people work together, uh, and uh, you know, so that's the first thing. The second thing I see of what you shared was that there's got to be a strong person to drive it. You know, so somebody who has a passion for it uh, should be put in charge, and say, hey, you drive it, you take it forward, and go with it you know so you need somebody like that and they will be able to get people in and when you know and, and they'll, they'll facilitate the whole thing and the third thing that Sevi say you mentioned is you're giving them the space you're giving them uh, the freedom of course it's going to be based on the Word of God it's going to come from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, but they have the freedom to do the thing that they, they want to do whether it be a drama uh, you know, whatever, whatever expression, spoken word, and so on, uh, that they give room for it. Right? So I think three very important points that Savi brought, say, shared, which, which, which is for you know, which I think all of us can take with us. Hey, if we want to see creative arts expressed in the local church, you know, and here are some things you need to have somebody, a pastor who has a vision for it. You have somebody to lead it. They need to be given the space for it. And then, of course, I would, you know, I would add another one point with to say what Sevi say has already shared is that there has, to, you know, we can facilitate the equipping and the training. Um, so there are people who are very good in it. They can come and they can train people. You know, this is how you write the scripts. This is how you do a production, uh, especially if it's a bigger production. And this is how you do it. This is how you plan it out. And there are people who have done it before and done many of it, and they can come and train people so we can leverage uh, gain from their uh, experience and so on good uh, Shrikuma, you want to add anything you want to say anything to this I have a question sir. Um, mm -hmm. I want to know that um, is any biblical uh, reference regarding to this like uh, when we are talking about this creative arts mm -hmm. so I just want to know that uh, do we have any biblical references because in the Bible like uh, we are not, I don't know that whether it is like, as you said about the paintings and other things. Uh, yes, music is absolutely, we can understand, but uh, drama, these things, I don't know whether it is mentioned. So how can we able to tell the church uh, that this is the part of worship and this can be used 
So I just want to know that uh, any biblical reference, if you can be able to help me. Run. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what we can do, uh, so, you know, we first of all look at God himself. Who is God? He's creator. God is creative. So creative creativity, creative expressions come from God, right? So that means he create means he's, he's bringing something into being. He's giving uh, life to an idea. So God is creator and he's creative. Now in the Bible, like we see, see um, there are expressions where God led people to act out, to act out his word. So to the prophets, he would tell them, do something. You know, that means he's given them a message, but the message is then communicated to the people, not only in words, but it's through their um, dramatizing that word. So most notably, we can point to Ezekiel, but and there are other prophets as well. But Ezekiel is the one who, on many occasions, God said, "Ezekiel, I want you to do this." You know, and for and even you know, when you think of Hosea the prophet, God said, "You know, Hosea, you go and marry, you know, you go and marry a, a prostitute." It's like, and that's totally against our mindset. But God said, "Do it because I want to convey a message through that." Okay, so that's like a real exception to the whole thing. But then we see in, Eze in Ezekiel, the God says, Ezekiel, I want you to do certain things. Jeremiah, I want you to do something. That means you are dramatizing the message to the people. So that's where you can get, you know, you can give a biblical validation to drama or any theater, any creative expression in action to communicate. The message of God. So this was a prophetic word, but it was being dramatized. It was being played out. Same thing in the New Testament. You come, uh, we can have any. We can have this example of Agabus, uh, Acts uh, chapter twenty-one. Uh, he comes to Paul, and uh, he dramatizes the word that God had put in his heart. So in his heart, you know, God has said, Agabus, go tell Paul that. Paul, when he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested and face a lot of trouble. So Agabus didn't come and say, "Thus says the Lord." Uh, I mean, he didn't just, you know, just he didn't just give a word, but he acted it out. You know, he took a um, a cloth, he tied himself up, and he then he said, "Thus says the Holy Spirit." You know, he took Paul's sash and he tied himself, and he said, "Thus says the Holy Spirit." So he acted out the message. And just another example where uh, the, the the thing that God wants to communicate can be commu communicated, of course, in word, but also in drama by acting it out. So we can point to these as examples. In terms of poetry, we can definitely point to Psalms. We can say, hey, the book of Psalms is just like poetry. These are uh, words that are written down which are messages from God where they are either meant to be sung or meant to be used in prayer or meant to be read and un understood and in, you know, receive inspiration. So uh, can God use poetry? Can he use writing? Of course, all of the Psalms are just that. Right? So in addition to music, we can point to these kinds of things that uh, will communicate to us. But I think Overall, if you just start with the premise of this understanding that God is a creative God and he can communicate to us in diverse ways and in diverse means, he's not restricted to only one way of communication, but he cover, communicates to us in multiple ways, then all of these creative expressions uh, have room. Uh, thank you, sir. I would just also want to know that can parable also be considered as a creative way of uh, sharing the word of God? Definitely, right. So that's a good point. Um, uh, that's a very good point. So even the Lord Jesus used stories and parables to communicate spiritual truth. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. So one last question before we change topic. Um, what do you think about 
sculpture, right? So for example, there are those who create um, artifacts, you know, images, uh, and um, uh, one very, very well-known designer um, or sculptor, or I would say Christian artist, uh, he he set up an entire place. Actually, it's a little island. I think it was. Uh, this is in the U United States. It's just a little island. It's it, and 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 his ministry was, was called Precious Moments. Right. So you go and you go to the island, and then you know it's just it's a beautiful chapel and a lot of things beautiful done. But he uses sculpture, little figurines. And like a little boy, girl, you know, little, little things, sculpture, um, uh, to communicate different things, you know, kindness, compassion, different things, uh, and it's it's so beautiful, right? Um, and so that that ministry is called Precious Moments, and they and, and they and, and they do these things, this work, and I'm just giving one example. I'm sure there are many like that. But sometimes when people work with uh, with uh, with sculpture, with with these kinds of things, figures and figurines, artifacts, um, some people object. So hey, God said, don't make any image of anything. So how would we respond to something like this so here's a believer here's a wonderful ministry it's a very it's a it's you know it's a very amazing place you go and see the work it's so beautiful and yet some may object what would your response be right would you be for it would you be against it how would you explain that yes god can even work through these things right so i just wanted to uh, put that question and see what. How would you respond to it? Go ahead, Roshan. Pastor, for, uh, I feel the way to convey to them to those who say that God said, "Don't build idols and all those things." Is firstly, like in the tabernacle, if you look, you see the lampstand, which is uh, you know, and the showbread, and all those things. So the lampstand conveys a message of the seven spirits of God. So God can use uh, these things like sculpture and these all these all these sort of things to convey mm. a message to us. Mm. So it's not that we worship it, but it's something that reminds us of what God is trying to say. Mm. 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 Uh, that's how I feel that we can just relate to such people. Mm. Thank you, Pastor. Good, very good. Good. Thank you. Um, sure. Say please, and then Christopher. Thanks, Russian. Just add to what Brother Russian has said. Um, if we look at from Genesis to Revelation, you'll find out that God, in His communication with man, like even the book of Daniel we just studied, is very symbolic in the sense that He most times starts with symbols that we are used to in our context. And then he draws the meaning or communicates the meaning. And sometimes by inspiration or by the Spirit of God, men understand what God is, say, is saying. So in that same light, bringing it down to sculpture, the gift of, of sculpturing things is from God. Mm. And we're supposed to use our gifts, regardless of whatever it is, to worship and to honor, to reveal and glorify Jesus Christ. Mm. So on that basis, there's nothing wrong. That's that would be my basis of explanation. There's nothing wrong for someone, you know, making statues, you know, making figurines, you know, that communicate Christ, that communicates um, the character of Christ or whatever scripture has taught us, you know, whatever that's found in His Word or His expectation of we Christians. There's nothing wrong if someone decides to do that. As long as the intent or goal is not to get people to worship those things, 
Mm. Then that would be the red line there. That would be the uh, that would be a no go area as long as it's not made for worship, but basically to reveal Jesus and to point people. Very very important to point people to Jesus, to mm. point them back to the Word, to point them back to worshiping God, to draw inspiration and to say, "Wow, your sculpture, your figurine has you know made me." desire to walk with God more has communicated the truth that I read this morning from scripture that the Lord has opened it up more again from your sculpture. You know, that should be the intent of any sculpture who is doing any kind of object or any figures, you know, basically uh, uh, um, 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 to, to get people connected to Christ. That should be the intent basically of any sculpture doing that. Mm. Yeah, that's how um, answer such person, you know. Yeah, thank good, good, thank you. Yeah, so it would be very clear in our minds these are creative expressions, either as an act of worship to God or a message to people, but we're not worshiping that piece, you know. So, and these are not, they're not like making a picture, you know, a sculpture of Jesus and say, okay, worship the sculpture. No, no. They're doing so many different things. You know, it, uh, you could have examples, simple, common things. You know, you see these praying hands, or you see so many things. You know, uh, uh, you could even some Bible stories are depicted uh, through that uh, work of art, uh, which brings inspiration, right? So, what Say is saying is, uh, uh, be, be very clear that it's communicating to us or glorifying God, but we're not worshipping it. And it's it's another way to uh, minister to people. Right? Okay, let's take the last two thoughts here. Christopher, you have something to say, and then Kennedy, you have something to say. Please go ahead. Yes, Pastor, I was just going to refer back to, um, you know, many, many centuries ago, you know, when there were people and artists who, uh, uh, you know, painted and even you know, did this kind of sculptures also, and um, this was their expression of you know, uh, you know how they they viewed uh, uh, or how they could you know creatively uh, represent um, what they was what they were inspired by. So, for example, you know, you know Michelangelo, you know, with this with the Sistine Chapel and uh, uh, there was um, some of the sculptures that he did. Uh, but they were different. There were there were some views about how he saw how he saw it and how it got represented. So, for example, in 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 some of the sculptures that he did, uh, and that are that are still available uh, to see, which are which are really a work of art, and uh, but they are actually represented, uh, you know, in in the nude. So even in the in the case of some of the paintings uh, that he did in the Sistine Chapel, which he took, you know, he took five years to build um and uh, sorry, to, sorry not build but to paint and uh there were views at that time that you know how could you represent uh you know creation and um you know the different um uh you know stories of uh, of the bible actually mm -hmm. which you represented on on, on those uh, on the ceiling mm -hmm. um but he represented it in the in a uh, you know, uh, people were so, some of them were you know just uh, totally you know they, they felt that, that 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 was not the right way to do it, and he he was inspired by that. So he just wanted to get a view of that, or what, um, how it, that how he represented it, and how it got you know uh, some people did not have they had a differing differing view of, uh, uh, or actually they felt they felt that they it was they were uh, you know, they they felt scandalized that you know that mm. that that was that was how it got represented yeah. Oh, so you are asking a question, Christopher? Like, yeah, my question is, um, in a, in an artist's view, they they will see things uh, differently, and um, they will represent something that that may not, uh, you know, uh, relate to you know um, how uh, it may not um, appeal to everyone. Or they may, some people may feel that it's it's completely you know wrong. It's not. It's completely wrong. And um, um, in the in the present time, also, if there were people who were you know you know painting or you know, making sculptures, mm. 
and uh, they were uh, representing it in say for example uh, you know you know in the mute for example mm. would that would that be would that be something that is um, right wrong you know uh, is that uh, is that something that uh, you know so I just wanted to get a view on that here okay yeah i'm just uh, i'm just <laughs> launching ESO to look up a verse i can't remember it now um uh, the verse says and i can't remember where it is to the pure all things are pure um that may understand uh, i don't know where the reference is but titus, sir i think it is in titus mm. chapter yes thank you thank you let me just look up titus um, um titus um, and let me just look it up here in Eastwood. Fifteenth verse. Okay, Titus one fifteen. Thank you so much, Titus one fifteen. Okay, so Titus one fifteen. Paul right. Uh, Paul writes. He says to the pure. All things are pure, but to those who are, uh, who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. Okay, so I'm just pointing to the scripture and trying to see, you know, how you apply it in this context. That is, uh, the question we ask is: Is there anything inherently wrong in in that particular work of art? Because it's actually communicating a biblical story, right? So the intent in that work of art, I, I, I'm not, I'm not condoning nudity. I'm just saying, in that particular, in the particular context of what we're talking about, it's in the chapel. It's communicating a Bible message, and so the intent of the artist. Or the expectation of the artist from viewers would be look at this with pure eyes. Whereas, you know, when we have uh, pornography or other, other things, that there the intent is look at it with unclean eyes, right? So I'm not condoning that, but I'm looking at the specific context where uh, there's a work of art in a chapel. Communicating a Bible message, Bible story, creation, other things. And what was the intent of the artist? Look at it with purity. Look at it because this is a pure place. I mean, a place of purity. So there, to the pure, all things are pure. Titus one fifteen. For those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but their mind and conscience is defiled. So my response would be, hey. What was the intent of the artist? And what is the expectation of the artist? His intent is pure, communicate a Bible story. Expectation is look at it with pure eyes. So now it's the responsibility of the, the viewer to look at it with pure eyes and to see it from that perspective. So that would be my response in this particular context, right? Don't we shouldn't take what I said out of context and apply it to uh, other things, but here in this context, that's how I would respond to it. Is that okay? All right. Okay. Um, let's quickly. Uh, this Abraham uh, Roshan says all things were created by him for him. Abraham says, I think they serve as a sign to remind us of God's goodness. Sign for signs to point us to something, not itself. Okay. That's right, Kennedy. You had a you had your hand raised, so uh, please go ahead. I think we might take it that the most important thing is to do the issue of content creation. Are you going to create a content that is going to glorify God, or are you going to create a content that won't honor God? Mm. So I think that's the the dividing factor. Because if if you if you make a content that is not worthy, then it's not worth presenting it. I think the most basic, basic thing is to have the guidance of the pastor, just have a content creator who is godly and who is 
going to give us something that is Bible based. Mm. Then we also look at the targeted audience. Who am I communicating with this to? Because what I'll do to the young ones in the Sunday school is not what I'll do to the youth. Mm. The content could be the same, but I have to have to titrate it in such a way that each and every person that I'm communicating with them can make a good content. Mm. Mm. Good. Thank you. So I think Kennedy um, highlighted two things. One is the person doing it, you know, who's creating that work of art, uh, that it should come, it should come from, obviously, come from a godly person with godly intent. So that work of art then is an expression of the person who's doing it. Um, it's expressing a godly intent. It's expressing a godly message. The other thing Kennedy was pointing out is, hey, who are you speaking to, right? Who are you communicating to? And you communicate to them in a way that they can, you know, it, it impacts them in a godly way, right? So that's something to keep in mind, that how I'm doing this should impact people in a godly way and move them to God. Okay. Anyway, so I just want to have these little discussions here on, on creator art. Um, um, so one is, you know, we need to develop this in the local church. Uh, uh, so that was the early, the beginning, you know, what we said, how do we develop it? How do we nurture it? And we need to be intentional because otherwise, you know, it, it might just happen once a year, okay? Some special thing happens once a year, but we need to, you know, on an ongoing basis, encourage people to use this, uh, to understand it, uh, its impact. Then the other part of that our discussion was in, uh, you know, in dealing in, in, in some things that may be questionable, but then if we, if we can help people understand that we are not worshiping the object that was produced by that art, it's only a, a means to either worship God or to communicate to people, and we're not worshiping the work of art, you know. And then, of course, we do it responsibly, making sure that whatever we express is going to have, is going to edify people, it's going to have a positive impact on people. Okay, last point uh, Roshan has said, uh, in regards to biblical sculptures and paintings by secular artists, as long as it is in line with biblical values, then fine. Yeah, that's also fine, you know, because there may be others who produce things, like when we talk about films, which we will talk about shortly, uh, there are, you know, even secular people who produce Christian films, many Christian, many, they, you know, it could be a Jesus film or something, uh, a documentary or something. We don't reject it. We don't say, hey, this film was produced by somebody who was not a believer, so I won't watch it. No, it's a, it's a, it's a film. Yes, it was done by a secular company or directed by a secular person, but it's a film. Maybe it's the life of Jesus. Maybe it's some other Christian story. We do watch it and it can still be a blessing to people. And I'm just talking general terms. Okay, so I'll just introduce our next topic and we'll pick this up tomorrow. Next thing I want, we want to talk about is media. We want to talk about print media. We want to talk about uh, films, movie, TV, radio, and then films. So three things, right? Three broad categories. One is print media. The other is TV, radio, mass communication, and films. I'm keeping internet separately because we're going to spend a lot more time and a lot more detail on the internet and you know learning, our, uh, talking about how it's how it can be used for ministry and so on. So I'm just leaving the internet aside, but looking at these tools for mass media, mass communication. We have print media, we have radio and television, and then we have films, you know, and all kinds of films. There are so many kinds of films. There are the full-length feature films, we have documentaries, we have short films, and so on, right? Now, I'm not talking, we're not, when we talk about films, we're not mixing it up with what happens on internet and social media. Those things we'll talk about separately, but I'm talking about regular films that, uh, movies that 
people produce, right? So print media, right? So we must understand the value of print media. I know a large part of the world has gone digital, yeah? Slowly, I'm not saying everybody, but slowly, more and more people are beginning to read online. So they read on their devices, they read, they read digital. But not everybody does it, or not, it's not a 100% thing. There is huge value in the old fashioned printed page, right? So there is great value. And right from the printing of the Bible, which was a tremendous, tremendous step. And because when the Bible was printed, oh, many copies were made and distributed, we see that it became accessible to the common man so that everybody could read it. Now, today it's gone to the place where you can have it on your phone, digital form. That's okay. We, we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later, but we're talking about the print, right? So how the printing press and the, the ability to print, we're talking about from a Christian perspective, just made the Bible itself accessible to the common man. And from there has been a tremendous journey where print media has been a tool by which God has worked and God has touched the lives of so many people. Right? So whether we are you know, whether there were tract distributions, whether there were the distributions of the Bible, the Gideons who made it their mission to, to put a copy of the Bible, and of course they did they, they used many different channels, but the mission was put a Bible in every hotel room. Where people go, you know, to spend their evening and get a copy of the Bible, put Bible in schools and so on. So, leveraging the print media has been a, a, a very powerful tool to impact the unsaved and, of course, also to strengthen the church by believers reading books and so on. So, I, so. The print, print media is not going to go away entirely. It will always have its place, even though a large portion has now gone digital. It will have its place. I don't think, at least in the foreseeable future, that print is going to go away completely. Uh, there will still be that, that place. I just want to add one more thought, and we will pick this up tomorrow, is that especially in um, certain segments of society, you know, whether it's uh, maybe in rural or even maybe for the elderly, uh, they prefer print. I understand in, in urban context, people are getting more and more used to digital forms. So they read on the phone or on the computer and so on. So yeah, that, that segment is there. But there's also this segment where People prefer print. And so for them, reaching them, getting to them, communicating to them through print media is still a very important um, way in which we must engage. Okay. I just just want one or two more thoughts and then we close for today. One of the things that um, that we as a church have done from the very beginning is to print our own books and to distribute them out freely. And the reason we, you know, we, we, we said we will distribute them freely is because, at least I'm speaking from here, our, our local context uh, in India, uh, there are large parts of our population who cannot afford to buy books, right? You can't. Exp First of all, there are no book books, Christian bookstores in their cities or in their towns. There are no Christian bookstores, so they can't even go and buy, it, even if they had money. And secondly, 
many people don't even have the money to buy it. So even if there was a Christian bookstore, they wouldn't have the money to go buy those books. So we said, you know, print media can be a very useful tool for us to reach people with the Word of God, with teaching from the Bible, so on. And if we can give it to them for free, we are breaking these, we are crossing these barriers. That means we will print and we will send it. So we're not depending on a Christian bookstore to carry it, because in most, most of their towns, in many of their cities, and definitely in villages, there are no Christian bookstores. So we're not depending on those bookstores. Only you know, big cities have these Christian bookstores. Otherwise, you don't find it. But if we print it, we can send it direct to them, the people who want it, or give it directly to them. Secondly, if you give it to them for free, and we, we must give it to them for free because they cannot afford to buy it. Right? They don't have the money to buy it. But at least if you give it to them for free, then they have a chance to learn the Word of God. And um, those who have money, uh, they will contribute to us out of their own free will. And we can use that money to bless the people who don't have the money to buy books, which is a very large population. And so with that mind, you know, uh, we started doing it uh, from 2001. And uh, of course, there are a lot of people who came and said, you know, no, 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 you must sell your books. You must sell your books. You must sell your books. Don't give it for free. Don't give it for free. But we were very clear. The reason why we're giving it for free is for the benefit of people who cannot afford it. And people who have money, we just... We don't want them to buy the book. We want them to give money to help in the printing of the book, right? If they buy the book, they might buy it for say hundred rupees or whatever that you know this amount we charge. And but when they give money, they can give ten thousand. They can give a hundred thousand rupees to help fund the printing of the book. And that's exactly what has happened, right? So over the last so many years, uh, you know, every year. Of course, during the pandemic, we had to pause a lot of so a lot of things had stopped during the pandemic. But before the pandemic and after that, uh, we have we right now just resumed the printing, and we still don't have full stock. But maybe in a few months, or you know, we'll have the stock. Uh, but the books are going out for free and in different languages, and people across the country are being blessed. You know, they can, especially people who cannot afford they can read and be blessed. So print media is a very powerful tool. And if we can use it, uh, it in a way that will help us reach the people who need it, the Word of God, then we can definitely uh, make it a very powerful ministry to serve people. Okay, so I'll pause you for today. Uh, we'll pick this up, and then we will talk about the other mass media tools. Uh, television, radio. We we'll look a little bit of history of Christian television, uh, you know, and to see where it's come, uh, and then we will talk about films, and then later after that we'll get into this whole internet thing because um, the 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 internet has, in many ways, uh, I wouldn't say completely replaced, but it has, uh, you know. Uh, really added to what was being done through the mass media communication tools of the internet is big space where you know you have videos of course you have digital books uh, everything has become a big platform to communicate uh, and so on so we'll deal with that separately okay um let's go somebody close in prayer and we will dismiss please Anyone could pray. God, Asha, thank you. God, thank you, Lord, for this 
achieve more about modern technology. And thank you so much, Lord, that you're such a creative God that we serve and we love, and that you are faithful, God, in everything that you've done. Lord. Thank you so much for Pastor Ashish and for all my classmates, God, as they're about to, uh, as we're about to end our class. And Lord, that we will think of, think about what our pastor have taught, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, that each one of them is blessed. And those who have, um, not those who are not feeling well, Lord, I pray for your healing. And I pray for each one of them, Lord, that your um, hand of protection will be over their family and them, Lord. Thank you so much for Pastor and everyone, God. We need me pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. We'll continue this tomorrow. See you tomorrow. God bless. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.